Welcome back to Chit Chat. This is episode 122, and we're going to be talking about a few things tonight. We're going to be talking about whether or not game designs have gotten stale. Mm. We're going to start with that. We're also going to be talking about some games that are definitely not stale because they're coming out at Gen Con or we've played them recently. This is part of our on the road to Gen Con coverage. We've whoop, got whoop. so many games yeah. to talk about. So many games we've been playing. We're trying to get a lot of those out there on the channel so you can see them before Gen Con because if you're going to Gen Con, you might want to know. And we will be doing a probably special chit chat or maybe a standalone video soon that is a most anticipated for Gen Con yeah. where a few of us will break down our lists of what we're really looking forward to or what we think maybe you should be looking forward to. Yeah, we're going to tell you what to look forward to. That's yeah. You should look forward to You this. should look forward to this. More stuff from MVM. <laughs> uh, no, but anyway, we're going to start with talking about whether or not game designs have gotten stale. And the reason this has come up because uh, some games have come out recently or some have been revealed where people have said, oh, this just feels a lot like the other game. In fact, we covered Farshore on the channel and we have a lot of people in the comments. Some people are excited. Some people are like, uh, isn't this pretty much just Everdell again? Have, has, have game designers run out of ideas? Well, and we talked about too, like old games becoming new. We talked about like, well, that's just kind of like the same game. Rehashing. But again and coming out again. So it's like, there's the same mechanics, it's the same type of games. When you go to Gen Con, you see a bunch of games and you're like, they tell you this game is like this game and this game is like this yeah. game. And you're like, okay, are these all just the, the same. same game now that I'm hearing over and over again? Right, yeah. but there are some games we can attest that are absolutely incredibly new. So I don't think, I think well, the answer I, is we haven't run out of game designs. We definitely haven't run out of game designs. I think both people are right. I think that there are a lot of game designs that we'll play where we go, okay, I've seen these mechanics before. I've mm -hmm. seen almost this exact game before. Or sometimes a second edition or new implementation comes along and you play it and you're like, well, they didn't really change anything. Yeah. Like, this doesn't feel fresh or unique. But at the same time, this year especially, I think we have had some of the most fresh, the freshest. The freshest. The like, freshest. Games? Like Mentos fresh <laughs> levels of freshness. <laughs> But, no, but we, we have, have we've had some really fresh and unique ideas for games coming out even in uh, up to this point in 2023 and the year's not even over yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's been a number of games and we've even said these in this in the videos that we've done to cover them that I just feel like I can't compare it to anything else really because it's so different enough mm -hmm. or completely different. I mean, really just some of them have felt like completely new. So we're going to talk about a few of those games that we've played recently, or maybe even not so recently, but I think all of them have been yeah. from this year. Oh yeah, from, from within the past couple of months, games that really stood out, I think, as being what I would call innovative. fresh or yeah. innovative or, or does do interesting new twists on things, for sure. What's the first one, Ryan? Well, the one, you know, when I was thinking about this, I thought of Rolling Heights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. And uh, I think one of the reasons that this drew to me was because it has this unique mechanic of like tossing the meeples. Which, even when I say it, it sounds so silly. And you're like, you toss meeples? And then based on where they land, they can land on their side. They can land standing up. They can land on their back. Which is almost all the ways that a meeple could possibly land. Thank you. Uh, and based on how it lands, they do different things. You can take different yeah. actions with them. And like you think, okay, that's so random. But then you start getting into this whole mitigation economy of like, well, then you can spend these things to rethrow these meeples. Or you can tilt this meeple if it's on its back it can stand up if it's tilted it can go you know and that powers a very interesting actual like game mm -hmm. but that mechanic alone to me felt very fresh even though maybe some games have used something similar mm -hmm. i have not played those games well yeah and even in the game itself I, while the rest of the game isn't exactly like n unheard of sure you know you know putting tiles out in this general area and building buildings on top of it but even that is a little innovative in terms of stacking oh, sure. everything yeah. But yeah, that meeple tossing in that game, I do think, I want to say that's been done to some degree. Even John DeClaire did something like that in another one of his games. I think Cubitos has a similar type of vibe. Mm. But yeah, it's a very well, it's fresh. Pretty new. It's very fresh and very innovative. And it comes from a standpoint of a designer like John going, I think, I don't know if he started with like, what if we threw meeples? Yeah. Like, because yeah, yeah. I think maybe they did, you know, like <laughs> you come up with that idea and like, oh, well, let's throw some meeples like oh well, they come up on different sides randomly what i thought was interesting too when david talked to me about this game i was like oh, i don't know if i'm gonna yeah. love it but like i do want to try it right that's yeah. what he feels innovative about it is like i don't know how it's gonna go but i still want to try and like when you you're you could say like wasn't it just similar to rolling dice right like 
But the thing is about dice, you know the probabilities, and we use dice in so many different games mm -hmm. by rolling them that you're kind of like, I understand pretty intuitively like what's likely and what's not likely. When you're rolling meeples, you're kind of like, I don't know, how often does it go on its side versus right. standing up? Like, is this, and it adds a lot of tension to it. Also, you had like ways to like re-roll them. Yeah. So you were like, there's a lot of tension in high fun moments where you're like, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen here? That you don't feel as much sometimes with dice games when you're so used to playing games with dice in them instead. Right, and there's something very unique and very fresh about grabbing literally, like you could get up to like, what, 10 meeples or something by the end of the game to throw at the same time. Yeah, well, Just even, scooping up those meeples, it just feels oh, really good. Even that effect the probabilities probably yes. at play because there's so much play with all that. Emily, Emily gets all that stuff way better than I do. I'm just like, meeples yeah. fall, I don't know. <laughs> Emily's like, well, if they bounce, if you had three meeples, If maybe... this bounces against this meeple, then this meeple... <laughs> She gets an abacus out and like a protractor when we're playing. <laughs> in between my turns. It's yeah. a protractor. That's a great use for that. <laughs> so that's one game. Another one that we played yeah. very, very recently. And in fact, this one is going to be available at Gen Con. Well, I Rolling think, Heights will be available, should be available. Well, every, at Gen Con. any game that's yeah. out will be available there for sure. But this one is just out at, I think, Origins and will clearly be there at Eschet. And that's Tribes of the Wind. Ah, yes. We literally just played this the yeah. other day, all four of us. It was uh, Emily, Ryan, yes, me, and Jeremy. Yes, all four of us. Well, Jeremy's somewhere in the world. <laughs> you know us. All four of us <laughs> from MVM. It's got to be Jeremy. <laughs> we played this game, and it is absolutely defies description in terms of like being able to say it's like this or like that. Yeah, but people have tried to do yeah, that. Yeah, I've heard multiple people say it's like Hanabi, um, but I didn't think so. I honestly. didn't get that at all. I didn't get that. And vibe. I love Hanabi, and I also like Traps of the Wind, but I wouldn't say that they're that similar. To me, it felt no. like this game has cards, so it's also like all these other games that have cards. Well, I think the reason people say that is because you put your cards up in a stand so that everyone can see the backs of your cards, but it's not like a deter you're not like trying to figure out what's on cards because mm -hmm. it's basically just their hand of cards. Just yeah. like you'd have in any game where everyone's have the hands of cards. You just need to know what the backs of their cards but are. But the That's backs all. of them are resources that everyone can kind of draw from, uh, or at least the neighbors can draw from, to actually play their cards. I might have a card that says, um, you know, depending on how much water your neighbors and you have, you can do this. Yes. So you just look at the backs of their cards instead of saying, hey, can I see the backs of your cards? So I see why people kind of think Say of Hanabi, that. but I would not. I, I, mean, I agree. Yeah. It would not be the kind of thing that I'd say because you're not deducing anything or trying. You, there's no, no hidden information to you. You know what the backs of your cards look like, too. So yeah. It's not the reason hidden. it's like Hanabi is like in most card games, you don't get information about it, your opponent's hands, right? Yeah. And right. in this one, you do get information. And that information is very useful to you. So depending on what David picks up, the cards in my hand are becoming more or less useful at different times. And I could be hoping, like, David, please pick up more green cards. Please pick up more green cards. So this one will be worth more. And he keeps not. But instead I'll have to play this because he's ended up picking up fire. So my strategy is very can be very dependent at times upon what my neighbors are doing. And that's what feels very fresh from other card games. Well, yeah, I can't say that I've ever played anything quite like Tribes of the Wind. Because there's, there's a lot going on in the game. And there's a whole board and you're putting tiles on that board and you're flipping tiles and completing objectives, all that, whatever. All of the entire game is powered by those cards. And like David said, like you're really looking around because if my card wants me to have the least amount of fire mm. cards, I'm just hoping like... Okay, well, I, I, I'm tied with David. I need to have the least. David, draw some fire cards, please. <laughs> draw some fire cards so that I can finally play this card that I've been sitting on that needs me to have less fire than my neighbors. And there's four different elements. And what, what felt fresh beyond that to me uh, was just the flow of that game of like, okay, I'm building up. I need a lot of fire cards because this one says I need to have three fire cards in my hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm playing all my fire cards and then it might be a while and now I'm going into another element and do another element. And everyone's doing that and so the the board state of what's out is changing yeah, yeah. so Pretty often rapidly. and i've never played a game that that's so like where i'm trying to send that mental thought of like david please well yeah <laughs> pick up that one specific card i need you to pick up and on the flip side of that if the player to your left if you look and they have a bunch like three water cards they're bound one of those is bound to be based on the power of how much water their neighbors have sure. and them so if you're going before them, there's another thing you can do on your turn where you just discard three cards to build a village. Yes. If you a discard shrine. all three, uh, or yeah, a shrine. If you discard all three of those water cards, all of a sudden they're going to be like, oh, now I can't even play this yeah, card. Yeah, but maybe they said they wanted the most water. Now That's you just it is possible. So you don't really know. It is possible. You, you can try to guess what their cards are going to do, but really it's more about what's 
available to you. Yes. Yeah, and yep. that whole thing fires off a, like you said, pretty meaty Euro experience. Yes, I mean, that's exactly. just the engine for playing this game. But yeah, you're playing tiles and even all that feels kind of fresh too to sure. me. I agree. And we didn't play the two player version, but in the two player version, you have like a your second neighbor is the row in the middle. So you have a lot more ability to be changing what your neighbors have and what's going on between there. And I think that's really yeah. innovative, for, yeah. especially for a two player where you're getting to see what they have, getting to see a little bit of the river and deciding what you're doing with those two. So adding that into another euro is like very different than what i felt before yeah the, the the third game i think we wanted to talk about and we've covered this one on the channel we've even done a live stream of it and that's books of time mm. books of time was probably one of the most recent games where we genuinely at the very beginning as, as soon as we learned it and as soon as we started playing it we were both and all of us were looking at each other going yeah i don't this is very different and it's not that it's doing things like at a base level different you have these cards it's kind of like a tableau but the way they've built it flipping these cards in these books makes it so different than a normal tableau yeah. that it feels completely fresh uh, yeah we played it we knew that like emily had to play it. like yes. as soon as i yeah. played it we were like get emily over here this is so innovative yeah and i remember we were at origins and someone asked us about games and we tried yeah. to describe books of time to them and tried to figure out like what mechanic we would say it's like and we were like well it's kind of like this kind of like that but it's, it just feels very different. And even though it might be like considered maybe Rondell, because typically mm. it's like a circle of actions, it's it I messes with I your head conceptually, that. right? Yes. Because conceptually, you're like, okay, kind of, but it feels, because it is, it feels like a book, right? And you're like really thinking about how do I slot in. It literally is a book. It's these little <laughs> binder clips. It literally is a book. Yeah. And so you're, you're putting things, slotting them into a book and your order matters and the way you're taking your action, it matters. Mm. and it's just so different from the way other games do their action systems that you struggle to figure out like what to compare it yeah, to. Yeah, see, really. I don't, I don't know that I would ever call it a rundown because, like, a lot of times when I think of a rundown, at least I think if you have the ability to, you know, move maybe as many spaces around as you want to take an or whatever. Sure. You know, sometimes you mm. can pay to figure, you know, actually move around a board. This, like, yeah, sure. When you get to the end of the book, you you go back to the front, but even that, like, the fact that you're adding these pages into it, and you're changing it, you could take an action to turn the page and then slot in another one because every page is front and back. So mm -hmm. what you're really doing is building your own custom action to take because when you, you take the action of the book, you're getting both pages. So if you're like, okay, well, I take this book, I use the action, I get it to flip. I don't like this matchup. I'm going to add another page. Now I like this matchup and yeah. now I've created an even better action. And that is not something I've ever seen before. Well, and plus, you're you're developing your own, but it's not just one of those. It's three right, of Right, yeah. three of those at the same time. So it's time. like, if it was one, I could see more of that comparison, but there's three of them, so it feels like there's always this like wide array of options of what you can do. And like you said, you're adding in more actions into it as well, depending on what you're doing in the game. Yeah, yeah it's like it's kind of like having three little mini decks of cards. Not, and I wouldn't say a deck builder, but you are adding right. cards you to those really three little decks. You really yeah. can't And going that. through them in order, and then flipping them back and going them through them in that same order. And like we said, changing them Potentially, the entire Potentially, but you're time. not, not going to get all the way through. You're, like, you're not going to be burning through these decks multiple times. Well, I, I don't think I've, a single one of them. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I've closed a book except once in all the It just depends on how many pages. Like, you could go through a book really quick, or you could put a bunch of pages into it, and it might take a lot, long time yeah. to get through that specific book. Yeah, so long story short, there are a lot of innovative games that are happening. So if you're out there and you think, ah, oh, been there, done that. Someone, please come up with a new game. Just know that, yes, while there are some games like that, mm -hmm. and that's fine too, because there's a lot of new gamers who maybe haven't experienced sure. that yeah, older yeah, yeah. game, and maybe there's a fresh take on it. So that's yeah, cool. That's true, you never know. But there are also a ton of new and very innovative games coming. And I think as we see more things, you know, we didn't even touch on like how people are using apps now to innovate you know, yeah, the games, because yeah, a lot of that yeah. has felt really fresh in the last year or two as well. And I'm interested too, what games have you guys found innovative, right? Are there any games you're looking forward to seeing yeah. at Gen Con or just generally that you're like, that looked fresh, that looked different, that looked cool? Tell us what you think and yeah, what you're looking forward you, uh, to. With, with, the, with like, what, 300 games coming out at Gen Con? Yeah. Out, yeah. You gotta be innovative, you gotta be fresh <laughs> if you wanna stand out. Well, there's out. bound to be at least one of those that's innovative. <laughs> <laughs> you hope so. <laughs> But we're going to be right back in just a second for a little player versus player. We're not going to be talking about innovative, fresh, or stale games, but we're going to be talking about the difference between some games. 
And we're back, and I've got my cards. I'm going to be the quiz master tonight. It's going to be, master. yeah, the quiz master general, actually. <laughs> Emily versus Ryan in a game that I'm going to call, what's the difference? Uh, now, I'm going to name two games and say, what's the difference? Now, th the answer isn't like describing the difference between the games. The answer is very numeric. It's the difference between those games on the BGG rankings. Ah. So these are going to be games that a lot of people might compare for one reason or another, but tonight we're going to be comparing them based on their BGG rankings. And I don't want the rankings, I want the difference between the mm. rankings. So feel free to the play The absolute along. value of the difference. Wow. Absolute value. <laughs> it... The closest to the absolute value. Without going over? Or we no, 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 no. Well, it's not over. It's either side of it okay. because okay. it's a difference yeah, between the okay. two. Okay, gotcha. Just the, Just the closest. And feel free to play along. So with that said, I've got... Well, no, feel free. We encourage you to play along. We do. Yeah. Don't just go to BGG, though. Right, we've got people <laughs> in the comments right now with BGG pulled up. I know I'm you can this. use the internet. We cannot. So. <laughs> All right, are we ready? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're going to give them both a chance to answer, and they're just going to compare the difference. Uh, we're going to start with Emily, mm -hmm. and then we'll go back and mm -hmm. forth, giving mm -hmm. Ryan the first opportunity. Okay. The first comparison. Emily, what's the difference? Uh-huh between Brass Birmingham oh God. and Brass Lancashire. Okay, so I, I haven't I played actually... either of the Brass games, but I know they are, I'm almost positive they're both in the top 100. And I think one of them is in like the 20s. So I'm gonna go with 20. I'm just gonna go with 20. All right, she thinks the difference between them is 20. Right. Uh, I, know, I know one of them is number one. Right. And the other one I think is like 30 something. So I'm going to say 32. 32 and 20? Yeah. What's closer? Emily's closer. Oh, what's the the difference? answer is 19. 19. Oh, wow. Is yes. one of them exactly 20? Now, this is as of recording this, by the way. So if, the, nice. if they've changed, who they knows? Changed. Gloomhaven may be number one again. Sure. But as of the time of recording, Brass Birmingham was number one, uh -huh. and Brass Lancashire was number 20. Exactly. Ooh, wow, I thought wow. it was a little, I was very I close. It was a little higher than that. Next up, we'll start with Ryan lower, this time. I guess. And I'm going to protect the card here if no one can see. I don't know if Emily was cheating. I don't think she was. What was that? <laughs> so Ryan, what's the difference yep. between Viticulture, mm -hmm. the Essential Edition, oh, okay. and Wingspan, both oh. from Stone Mine. Oh my god, this is another one where I think they're both not only in the top 100, but also in the top 50. Should um, we give hints? No. No? no? Okay. Uh, when I start, you Viticulture should Viticulture is... They are both in the top 100. I think they're both... I think they're... I think like 10. The I'm difference gonna, is 10? I'm gonna think, I think they're like 10. I'm gonna say 10. I think they're both like in the top half of the top 50. I don't think they're that close to each other. I, again, I was going to go 30, but now I'm going to go lower than that. Because yeah. right. She didn't so think, but I now she does. So I will again go 20. 20. Oh, you're just going to answer 20? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. David just 20. chose a bunch of games that were, were exactly 20 apart. 20 apart. I will give you a hint. I didn't make questions, so the answer was I think Wingspan is in the first 30, and I think that Viticulture is in, like, 40 through 60. So that's why I was going to so say 20. 20. Yeah. yeah. And what did you say? I said 10. Well, the answer is eight. Eight? Yes. Knew, uh, you are kind of close. Wingspan is number 25, uh -huh. and Viticulture was number 33. I did not think Viticulture was that hot. Viticulture, I didn't people think it was love either. Viticulture. Viticulture. It has no, no, its no. fans. I mean, I, it's, if it's the essential edition, I guess. You know. It definitely has its fans. Eight, that All was... All right, back to start with close. Emily. I was. Are we ready for this one? Yes. Emily, what's the difference between Agricola and Caverna? Oh, God. Ooh. Should be like nothing, but I feel like this what? is a, a they're trick right question. Next to each and I think it like is. So, so dim of, well, I think that Agricola's got to be higher, right? And again, I think this is a trick question. Which came out first? Which one was the freshest? The freshest was would be the one that came later. Sure. So Caverna. Okay, you're right. About that. <laughs> Thank you. So hey, fa like factor that in to yeah, but which one that... you think it, which one's higher? I don't higher. think Caverna is higher. I think Agricola okay. is higher because I think more people have played Agricola, uh, see, and the... you have to have more ratings in order to get be able to get a higher score that on BGG in some ways. That's the trick. Mm -hmm. What you just said at the end there is accurate. So, but it makes me think it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think they should be very close, but I think they're probably not. I'm gonna go with like. 12. Oh, not 20 this oh, time? Not 20. I think they should be like two, but I, I don't 13? think they are. Uh, if you're saying 12, I am I actually think it's probably closer to like... 
Give us a number, Ryan. Just because Agricola's been out so much longer and it's so much more well-known, even though I think a lot of people think Caverna's the better game, mm -hmm. I think Agricola's probably higher. I think probably by like 22. 22. That's well, first of all, awesome. Caverna is higher oh, than Agricola. Really? Even That's Agricola. Really? I'm glad. I'm actually glad for that. I think Caverna's the better game. Caverna, it is. I, I believe it is. Caverna is higher by three. Three. Oh, they were that That's close good. together. They should be that close <laughs> together. Man, we, I should have just stuck with the one. Do you know what numbers they were? Yes. Uh, Caver at least as of time of recording, Caverna was 43, Agricola 46. Yeah, that wow. sounds about right. I should have just said one. I really thought about one. I'm glad they were that close, but that's kind of crazy because I feel like sometimes they were. Well, just I, that way was off. my first instinct was they were going to be really close, but I thought David was throwing a curveball. It's ball, funny too and that they are. My own head. They're closer than the two brass games. They are. Right? That's like, funny. <laughs> I've got a curveball coming up because oh, no. everyone oh, knows Pandemic Legacy Season One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is very highly ranked. Yeah. Yes. Or it was at one point in the it top still ten. Is, is yes. it still in the yep. top ten? Well, what's the difference between Pandemic Legacy Season Two and Season Zero, Ryan? Ooh. Oh God. I don't feel like season zero got the attention and the love. Did you play both of those seasons? I've played all three of the seasons. I've also, Have you played, played multiple played times? Them. No, I've not played them all. I don't generally do legacy games multiple times. You just play them once? Usually. Uh, I, I thought you played them once. Go no, ahead. I'm going to say like, whew, I'm going to say actually like 30. 30? Yeah. You're going to go back to your 20? No, I'm going to go even more. I'm going to go 40. 40? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I like that. I don't are think changing. season zero got Raise the same it up. Of, Even though I thought season zero was great, I don't think that's the widely accepted feeling. Well, which one do you think is ranked higher? I think season two, two is ranked higher. Season zero is ranked higher. Okay, really? okay good. That's, Thank you, community. I think it's the better game. I'm surprised. That's well, not what I've heard talking about. Right. Most people, people that do. I talk to say that they didn't like zero that much. Yeah, most people, uh, apparently more people like zero better than season two. I'm glad two. to hear that. But just barely. Oh, really? Because they're one apart. No, they're what? not. <laughs> right? Wow, I was Pan way off. Season zero is 49 and pandemic season two was at 50. Wow, they wow. all three made the top 50. Yeah. That's, wow, that is yeah. awesome. All right, next up. We've got two more. Oh, wait, I okay. got that one. So then, right? speed this you one up. That, that was one. way off. Yes, Ryan. Oh, that's yeah. Your Who, point. Was that his first 30, point? 30. So he no, was that was closer. my second point. Oh, really? It's two to two? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, boy. Is this the last one? Nope. Oh. We got two more. Oh, we could. Not. I should make the two. I should have made it odd. Should have made an odd number, right? Should we treat the nope. last one as a bonus? Yeah. Let's just get it. All right, we'll treat this the last one as a bonus. This, this one's for the all the marbles. Oh, this is the real last one. What's the difference, Emily? Yes. Between heat okay. and flam rouge. Oh God. Is flam rouge even in the yeah. top one hundred? Flam rouge has been around for a lot longer. But I don't think it's in the top 100. I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't know if Heat I mean, is, I honestly, either, because it's Heat's very new. Heat's so new, it's kind of hotness. You're right, but I don't know if it's made it up to the top. I don't know if Heat's made it up to the top 100. I'm going to go with a large number, because I don't think... Once they're past the 100, they could be very, they very far They could be apart, very apart. far. Like hundreds of Right. Apart. So I'm going to go with a larger number, just say 50. I th I might have I was thinking it would even be higher than that. It really could be because again, once you get past oh, the top 100, I think it's they could higher, be all bets are off once you're out of the top 100. Right, Flam Rouge could be 124. Because there's a lot. Well, yeah. yeah, it could be a thousand and fifty. Yes, exactly. <laughs> What'd you say? 50? I said fifty. I'm gonna Don't say, say fifty. I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna say forty because that's really what I feel. Mm. Forty? You think it's closer? Yeah, I think. What do you think 40. the rankings are? I think like, he's higher than Flam Rouge. I think. You think they're like, well, like what number do you think? I think like Heat's probably low, like uh, in the top 100, but maybe like 80s. Uh -huh. And I think Flamme Rouge is probably 100 and something. I think Flamme Rouge is way farther, but I don't know. Okay. Okay, well, I don't know. This... Well, Heat is higher ranked uh -huh. at 81. Hey, I Flamme see. Rouge is 236. Oh, yeah. 200. The, the difference yeah. being 155. I yeah. really thought it was closer than that. So Emily takes the game. Let us know in the comments how close you were, but we do have one bonus, bonus one. one. And this one's near and dear to my heart. Oh, okay. no. Emily will roll her eyes, I'm sure. What's the difference, both of you, yeah. it's between... Be. The Witcher Old World uh -huh. and The Witcher Adventure Game. Oh, God. Oh. I'm Which surprised is... it's not Castles of Burgundy, honestly. But... Oh, that's true. I'm going to say 200. What is the other one? 200. Witcher Adventure Game was a game. Was that Fantasy Flight? Yeah, I don't think that got much love at all. I think it that's... did not. I, think I can that's... tell you it didn't get as much love I think as The Witcher It got the very, Witcher very old little world. love. <laughs> I think 200. I'm gonna I say. also give you a hint. I think the Witcher, I hope anyway, that the Witcher Old World 
climbs from where this number was when we it will tallied it this. will as more people people don't have it yet uh, so what did you say did you answer? i said 200 difference I'm gonna go 400 difference. They wow. sound very different. After well, the this. Flan Rouge one, now we're all all over the place. So the Witcher adventure game is ranked 3,301st. 3,000. <laughs> well, okay, this is gonna be Emily. And the Witcher Old World is 2,315. So the difference was 986. Wow. Yep. Well, but again, this was when I tallied these. Even right now, as I'm saying this. I'm sure the Witcher old, well, the Witcher, old world has. You guys gone are right now writing a review going up. for which well, people are starting to get it. Finally, people are starting to play it. it it's finally a... starting to become available in retail. I think that this one is going to continue to climb. One hundred percent. As people continue to play, I would be very surprised if it didn't rest somewhere in the top one hundred. I'm surprised you didn't I give us so. the number between where you think it should be and where it is right and now. <laughs> that is infinity. <laughs> David's like it should be number one on BGG and no game should ever su surplant it. I like the Witcher old world quite a bit. I do think it will I hope that no, it will find it's, a, its way into the top 100. I, hope so too. I don't know that it will but I really think it low. should. I, well, it's just because it's new. When there's yeah, new games, new. it takes a while for them to get reviews on BGG. And if they don't have enough, they keep staying yeah, lower that is because the they problem. won't be able to grow higher. Plus, high. I literally tallied these the other day or even a week ago and these might be even fresher. Well, for yeah, and well, the, but he hasn't been out that long, and it's already, that's true. That's true. Yes. But that one, that game is so good. So anyway, let us know what you thought about that game in the comments What's below. The What's, What's, the the What's the difference? What's the difference? What's the difference? And we'll be right back and talk about some of the games we've been playing. But before that, let's talk about Phantom Sleeves. If you play board games with cards and you want them protected, you should check out Phantom Sleeves. They're top-notch quality, easy to play with, and they care about your cards and the environment. Plus, Phantom Sleeves are made with board gamers in mind. The sheer variety of sizes and shapes is kind of crazy. So no matter what game you're playing, they most likely have the perfect sleeve. And whether you want to see your cards crystal clear or avoid that annoying glare from the lights above your table, they've got you covered with both glossy and matte options. And if you're like, I just don't sleeve my cards. Well, maybe you should stop and think for a second. Who's going to protect the dusky leaf monkey? Phantom sleeves, that's who. So, Emily, you start us off. What games have you been playing? Now, I'm asking this question, but I know because we played this. You played it with me, yeah. yes. I We recently played Pandante, which is not a new game, but it did feel fresh. Nor will it be available at Gen <laughs> It is not I available never at know. I don't, you'd have check to go the flea market. check the flea market. <laughs> it might be there. And I don't even say that sarcastically. I say check the flea market. If you can oh, find yeah. this game, yeah. I think you should it was fun. grab it. It was a fresh take on poker, right? Yeah. The, the game says the that it's, it's lying, poker, and pandas. And pandas, you know. <laughs> Those all go That's together. That's the tagline. That's the actual competition. The tagline? Yeah. yeah. Again, I'm not even joking. It is. And so we played this recently, the four of us, but I also played it with my family over the 4th of July holiday. And we played it because my stepdad really likes poker, and I'm not great at poker. I'm very bad at bluffing, and I'm very bad with, like, gambling money. But this game <laughs> is very fun because it really encourages lying. Like, okay, you can call it bluffing, but it really even pushes further than poker does. I'm like, if you can lie and get away with it, you can win a lot. Yeah. It uses similar to the poker hands, except for it adds in a fifth suit. It just does numbers one through ten and puts pretty pandas on them. And then you get to bluff each round with how high you think of a hand you think you can make. But there are lots of ways to change your hand, unlike regular poker. Yeah. So each round you're getting to pick up a possibly pick up a card and discard yeah. one from your two pocket they cards. They call it snacking, right? They call it snacking. <laughs> There's a lot of pandas. There's a lot of panda themed things. They, they, it's not even the the flop in the river, it's the what? It's like the, 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 the paws, the paws the and the tails. tails. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the splash. The yeah. splash. Um, and then there's ways to like add a sixth community card instead yeah. of five community cards. There's ways to like get you to just discard at the end your hand and get a new hand entirely. Yeah. So it's it's a lot more like chaotic, I would say, than poker, but it has a lot of the same elements. So I, I think of it like almost like a poker light game with Pandas. It yeah. is. It was like um, it's like poker. It's it's very much like poker. They do streamline a lot of it because all the hands are out there on the board, and like she said, you can kind of evolve that. Like your initial bet, you can go like, ah, oh, I think I'll get three of a kind. So you put your bet on the three of a kind column, but then later there is a chance to go, oh, I'm going to upgrade my bet yes. to full house. And even in doing that, 
there's some bluffing involved mm -hmm. because who's going to do that if they don't have the full house? Well, someone yeah. might. Um, and on top of it all, they streamlined the betting. So you're not like, oh, how much should I right. bet? It's bet this amount. Yes. And it's like a static amount that you're time. adding to it, almost like a continued blinds or ante if yes. you're familiar so with poker. There is a power that lets you raise and makes everybody else put in some more money. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that the, the inclusion of the powers is what makes that game so interesting. And not just like the actions that you can take, but also each panda has its own variable power as yeah, well. Yeah, it is gamified uh, these, for sure. These actions are wild because it's like you can look at another player, a card from another player's yes. hand. Okay, you can't do that in regular poker because you're not... And you're not really bluffing. It, it's not really like that standoff where it's like, who do we think has the better hand? I yes. know that David is saying he has, he has five hand. of a kind. I don't, I don't have to try to like use that poker logic of like, okay, if there's a two and a three on the flop, then maybe David has the four, you know. Yeah, like, you're not thinking someone could have anything. Right. They, they have, have to have the thing they, that they've declared. You're saying you have four of a kind. And yeah. I, can look at the, I can look at the whole community pod and be like, there's, there's no only way. one. <laughs> and David has two cards in his hand. He That's does, not possible. And then David, I see David other sweating bullets because when it comes down to it, you everyone else at the table has a chance to challenge whether or not you're playing the right hand. And if exactly. everyone thinks, okay, well, there's three eights out there. What are the chances that David has an eight in his hand? Pretty good. I'm not going to challenge it. And then David throws it out and he had a one and a two. He never had the four eights. Yeah. Yeah. You can win that way, and that's a pretty cool moment. It's a really fun game. It felt like a game from 1974 to me. <laughs> like the box, the production, everything. Your after old Hasbro play, game. After playing it, I genuinely thought, like, you know, a publisher today should take this and, like, revamp it, make it nice. I, I, I had a lot it's of like, fun with it. Not even, ten, it. not even a 10-year-old game. We can always count on Emily to bring some <laughs> crazy game to the table. Like, what is this? And then we're like, this is fun. Yeah. yeah. It was a good time. So, uh, speaking of mind games, we played another game. And this was just Emily, oh. Jeremy, and I played Dawn of Ulos. This is from Thunderworks. And I didn't really know what kind of game this was mm -hmm. when they sent it to us. And then I read the rules, set it up before uh, Jeremy got here the other day. And we played it, and this is an area control-ish mm -hmm. game, but you're not really representing any of the factions that are on the board. We're all playing gods sort of controlling the territories yes. of those factions, but it's really more of a stock and economy, economy game, game because all of the factions that are in any given game, and there's multiple factions, and you choose six of them, they all have a deck of cards too, and all those cards are the same. So if you have a goblin card, it's just like every other goblin card. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in the game, you're adding tiles. You basically have three tiles, and you're always adding a tile to the board, so you're going to be expanding someone's region. Area. And there's rules for doing that. The, the hexes have different, they're these double, double hex terrain types. Um, but you're also able to purchase some of the cards represented by some of those factions. And the cost and their strength and how many spoils they'll give you depends on where they are on this track. And their track is, uh, their position on that track is dependent on how many territories in their region that they control are the types of terrain that, they, that favor. they prefer or that they favor. So there's a lot of really interesting things going on. There are, but the coolest part is definitely the conflict, the conflict. right? So at some point, you're going to put down a territory that's going to connect two or more of the different uh, territories. And at that point, you have a conflict, yeah. right? And so what happens there is everyone around the table can put in cards for either side of the conflict. Or even or other both. factions. Yes, or other factions. As a so bluff. You, you could say, like, I'm putting in seven cards, and three of them are for this side, four of them are for that side. But really, those seven cards are all just bluffs. And it's all face down at that point. Yes. Everyone's putting in there, and it's kind of like willy-nilly. There's no, like, turn order at this point. You're doing it simultaneously. It encourages a lot of conversation table talk, yeah. and table talk. And then once everyone's ready, everyone reveals and you're like, oh, you didn't put any goblins in. <laughs> like, I thought you were going to put goblins in. Now Emily's running away with it. Yes. And it's really interesting because once a faction loses, their power on that track goes all the way back down to zero. Exactly. Until they're brought back on the wow. map, which can happen. So by the end of the game, which triggered in a couple different ways, if you run out of tiles or if two of the factions happen to ever highest. get up to the highest point on that track, they become legendary. Um, and then you effectively just look at the cards you have in your hand left and what the values are of them based on that track. 
It was a really fun game. It had a lot of interesting decision making too, like because one of the things those uh, basically cards are stock, but they also have powers on them that yeah. you can use as well on your turn. So each time you're thinking about like, do I want to use it for its power? Do I want to use it during a conflict to try to up how powerful it is? Or do I want to just wait on it until the end of the game? Because I think it's going to be worth a lot of points. And yeah. if I have the most of anybody, I'm just going to get a ton of points. There was so much decision making in it that I, I really liked how it felt. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I almost com completely forgot <laughs> about that because it's not just a stock card. These cards, yeah. there's a lot of reasons for you to use them at various uh, points in the game for a, a wide variety of reasons. It does seem, I wish I could have played it. It's, I saw the, the demo at, at Origins and it will be at Gen Con. So yes, yes it, it is a Gen Con release. Yeah. And, and I think, it, I want to say it plays up to five. We yeah. played it at three and it played really well it at three. It played really well at th three. Yeah, I really like that because we could keep track a little bit of like, okay, I'm pretty sure David has a lot of goblins and I'm yeah. pretty sure you have a lot of like the sa satyr. And so I'm trying to get you to get your cards in for conflicts. It led to a lot of big moments that I really appreciate. And stupid appreciated. play on my part. <laughs> <laughs> like, I literally did some bonehead moves. It is one of those games where I'm like, okay, I think I have a grasp on it and now. Let's really... play again. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I'll do just as poorly. <laughs> so, the last one that I want to talk about is another Gen Con release. This is called After Us. This is a game about the uh, you know extinction of humanity, and you play as monkeys. You play as these Planet groups of, of the monkeys. Apes, yeah. All Almost, sorts of primates, actually. All, all sorts of primates. I shouldn't use the term monkey to mean every... Yeah. Apes, all sorts of different primates. Orangutans. Apes, orangutans, chimpanzees, whatever. And you're kind of collecting them from these different decks to kind mm -hmm. of build out your own deck. But it's not really a deck building game, even though it kind of sounds like it by that Just description. A little, bit. a little bit. There's a little bit, but it doesn't function like any other deck builder. This probably could have yeah. even applied to like fresh games because 100%. the way that this works is so interesting. You have a hand of four cards and every card has boxes. And some of these boxes are just small little boxes with a resource in them. But some of these boxes go to the edge of the card. Mm -hmm. In order to build that box out, you have to play another card next to it so that that box actually connects. It's enclosed. And so that it's fully enclosed and you're gonna get some amount of reward. Some of these are gonna be turn in, you know, some resources for points. Yeah. You're collecting a different batteries and stuff, whatever. We actually have a video that we'll be posting so you can get much more in detail look at this game. But building out that puzzle was very interesting and yeah. every different type of primate focuses on a different aspect of the game. Some score you points, some are just generically flexible, some get you rage, which is something you're tracking. So. All of that stuff combined leads to these really interesting puzzle decisions mm -hmm. of how to build out that tableau. And really, that's, that is the core of the game. You're just building it out, collecting a bunch of resources, and racing to 80 points. The other big thing about it is that it is simultaneous play, yes. right? So it's very quick, because even if we played it, we did play it at four, and it went very fast. I think it really actually only took us 45 minutes. Yeah, it's it, it, not a it long is game. super quick, and it is because of that simultaneous play. But I will say it is one of those games, too, where you got to trust everyone at the table yes, not to sure. make mistakes and yes. to be on their best behavior because when you're playing like sure. that, everyone's like, okay, I'm taking this, I'm winning this, I'm getting this. And again, we're even moving our guys around the, the score track at the same yes. time. There were literal times where I'm like, oh, I'll wait and let you move. Oh, mm -hmm. now I'm moving. So there's a lot going on. And it felt like... It's not at all like space space, but games where you're racing to yeah. a certain amount oh, of points. Sure, sure, sure. It just felt that way to me in terms of like, oh, and now it's over. Okay, we won. You yeah. know, like <laughs> I mean, it is, it is a, yeah, and that is the one thing with race games. And I think like, okay, it being such a fast-paced game, it being simultaneous play, and it, it, you can get to eighty points. I mean, we didn't even play a ton of rounds because you can no. get some really big turns, especially later on, where you're getting like maybe 10 to 15 points in one round yeah. if you're doing things really well. I think it would be a really good one for people to demo at uh, Gen Con yeah. because it's it's really fast teach, it's a really fast play, and if you just play a couple rounds of it, you'll definitely get a feel for what the game is like. And you for don't sure. have to like see, it's not like something that has three phases and it ramps over time, it's like... Well, it does have three phases. <laughs> sure, it does technically have three phases in each round, but it's not something that like ramps and sure. you, you could get the feel from it. You know, speaking of that, and I'm not just saying this to tag onto that joke, uh, it is interesting because the end game can trigger in a phase. Oh, that is oh, true. Yes. And you don't finish yes. the whole round. You literally end the game at the end of that phase within a round, yes. which is kind of interesting. So it truly is pretty much a race game. It yeah. really is. Because, they, yes, they break it into three phases, but they don't feel so no, separate. They don't. When no, you're playing it's, it, it's they feel so flow. continuous. Yeah. It's just like, and now we're doing this, now we're doing this, and now we're doing this. And you're like, wait, what? It can be Eat? easy for some players to maybe get a little ahead of everybody else. Yes. You kind of have to like, okay, everyone pause at this moment just so that we can get all synced up yes, again. Yes, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it was really fun. And at the same time, kind of chill. 
Yeah. Very chill. Like, because you're really only playing your own game. Mm -hmm. It did, I will the say that. Some player interaction, very A little. little bit of player interaction, but for the most part, it just felt like we were playing our own game and s until someone said, I'm at 80. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's the race element. Who could do it better? Who could do it faster, right? And there's yeah. a solo mode for it, too. So on that note, you could also play it yourself in yeah, so, a chill game. And, and so both of those games that we talked about are at Gen Con Pendante. Maybe Gen Con in the Tell future. Tell us if you find after, it at Gen Con. Or after a publisher watches this video and goes, yeah, you know what? This does need a new edition. And tell you what, if Emily will let us, we'll bring her copy of Pandante. I will have there it all. That would be a lot of yes. fun to play. If you want to play Pandante at Gen Find Con. us at Gen Con and we will get an, an impromptu game of say, Pandante Say code going. word Pandante. Just come up and say it. That's <laughs> all you got to do. Just Yeah, just give us a little signal and we'll know. Pandante. <laughs> Anyway, be sure to check out all of the content we have coming out. We have a ton of stuff coming out for the yeah. Road to Gen Con coverage. And then we're going to be at Gen Con. If you're going to be there, do track us down. We like to say hello. Come into our Discord. You can hear our, all about our plans. People yes. talk about where they're at. We can meet up. So. Yeah, we're going to do a whole community game night one of the nights with our MVM community. But the, the best way to find out about it is the Discord. 100%. Yeah. Until then, make sure everyone has fun at the table. And we'll see you next time.